Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. pH is one of the most important things in a garden. Get it wrong and your garden won't do well. Also, the hummingbirds are starting to fly south for the winter. We're going to hang a feeder to help them fuel up for their long trip. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Celeste Scott. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County, and Mrs. Debbie Bruce will be joining us later to hang a hummingbird feeder. All right, Celeste. Hey. Let's talk a little bit about pH because pH is so important and you're going to tell us why it's so important, right? It is so important yes. and, and folks just don't realize how important mm -hmm. it is. So I know that we preach uh, with extension and, yes. and many other professions, uh, preach the importance of soil sampling um, before you begin any kind of gardening endeavor, whether that's, you know, vegetable gardening mm -hmm. or landscaping or what have you, um, but it truly is super important. Um, if nothing else, to be able to determine what your pH is right. or the uh, level of acidity in your soil. What pH stands for, it's a little P and a big and H. And a big H, yeah. right. <laughs> so that stands for potential hydrogen. Okay. Um, hydrogen is acidic, and so that's just measuring the level of how much uh, potential hydrogen is in your soil okay. um, and telling you whether it's acidic or basic. Um, pH runs on a scale of 0 to 14, mm -hmm. and it's exponential. So, for example, 7 is right in the middle, so right. that's what we're going to call neutral. Anything below 7 would be considered acidic, mm -hmm. or old, some old-timers say it's sour. Yes, yeah? sour. So, it's sour or <laughs> right. acidic. Anything above mm -hmm. is basic, right. alkaline, or, uh, again, sweet. sweet. You may refer to right. it as sweet versus sour. Um, so that's kind of how it goes. Now, if we're looking at a pH, if we tested our soil and it came back a pH of 5, mm -hmm. and we were going to compare that to another area that came back with a pH of 6, it doesn't appear to be that much difference because you're thinking, well, it's just one number, right. you know, different. But like I said, it's on an exponential scale. So that's a pH point. of 5 is really 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. Likewise, if you move up to a 7, a five would be a hundred mm -hmm. times more acidic. So every full single number mm -hmm. that you move up, you're you know moving exponentially. So it really right. does make a big difference, um, and it's important for us to know what we're starting with so we can adjust properly. You're exactly right, and I'm glad you mentioned that because people think it's so easy because they see the one number, yeah, five to six. Oh, it's just one. Yeah. Right. So. Or even you know you're never really going to get those even numbers anyway. You right. could get like a. 5.4 or sure. 6.2 or something right. like that and <laughs> and they'll think well uh, there can't be that much difference between a 6.0 and a 6.5 but again even those decimals mm -hmm. are uh, are need to be taken into account That's when you're difference. thinking about the exponential scale. All right good stuff. Mm -hmm. So what causes an acidic soil though? Well there's lots of different situations. Okay. So in West Tennessee, a lot of soils are naturally acidic. Mm -hmm. And that is just determined by the parent material that your soil was made out okay. of. So like mm -hmm. the bedrock that, you know, was degraded and now has become mm -hmm. your topsoil. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is dependent upon that. Um, there are also some practices that humans do <laughs> so <laughs> that could create uh, acidic soils. Right. So let's think about... Um, there's lots of development going on yes. and so anytime topsoil is removed mm -hmm. you're removing some of the uh, natural amendments of the soil and, exactly. and you could end up with a more acidic soil. Um, new homes a lots of times when they remove that topsoil and then they're backfilled with what they think might be topsoil but it isn't really um, and so <laughs> yeah, not exactly <laughs> right. right they could end up with acidic soils that way also, um, just continued use of land. Mm -hmm. uh, plants are taking uh, soluble nutrients out of the soil. So things like, you know, potassium, magnesium, uh, calcium, and when those are removed from the soil solution or even removed from water, if you're having lots of rain or something like that, those can be replaced with right. those hydrogen ions, which 
cre increases the acidity of your soil. Okay. So any kind of land that's in continuous use um, might have the potential to be low, uh, have a low pH or have a more acidic soil. Okay. All right, so what are the benefits of sampling in the fall, though? Right. I mean, because you can sample any time, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. The fall mm -hmm. just tends to be a little better, you think? Yeah, I think. Okay. You can sample any time of the year, sure. and you can amend any time of the year. But yeah. for me, um, most of the time, especially if we're talking about vegetable gardening, okay. you know, we're, right. we've got to have some forethought with this. You want to start a new site in the spring, or you had problems in your garden site this past year, and you want to uh, try to get ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Sample in the fall. Um, the lab is usually slower. <laughs> it is. It is in the fall. It is. Because <laughs> in, in the spring is when people are getting geared oh, up yeah. usually, and so they're sending in lots of samples. So the lab is generally a little slower. You can get your results a little faster. Our soils tend to be drier in the fall, mm -hmm. and it, when you send in a soil sample, it really needs to be dry. Okay. If it's not dry when it gets to the lab, then they have to let it dry. So that could add a few days onto okay. your sampling time. Um, and then, of course, if you live in West Tennessee, like we do, yeah. here in the Mid-South, yes. <laughs> or in the Mid-South in general, mm -hmm. I guess we should say, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> your soils are going to naturally be on the more acidic right. side. So we're looking at probably around 6 to 6.5, could even be lower, you okay. know, just depending upon where you are. So if we need to amend that pH and raise it, um, we're going to do that by adding lime. And lime takes time to change sure. Uh, the chemistry of the soil. It's not something that's going to happen immediately. So that's why I like to test in the fall so you can go ahead and get that lime on the ground now and by the time spring comes around you've already started that process of changing okay. the chemical you know makeup. Uh, so it'll be ready to go for the most part because it gets weathered in and broken down. Right, okay. yes, yes. Oh, I got that. So that's why I prefer fall. Okay, uh, while we have a little time left, suggested pH for plantings though. Yes. What are some of those? Okay, so if we're looking at like lawns, okay. I would say most turf grasses, uh, six to six point eight. I mean, you could go a little lower. Okay. Um, don't want to go too much higher. Uh, they tend to kind of prefer some of that okay. acidic acidic soils. Areas that are naturally kind of like wooded, if you have a wooded lot around your home, right. those soils are going to be naturally more acidic because they're having a lot of leaves and things right. that are falling and yeah, decomposing. Right. Um, so that would be common, you okay. know, for that type of area. Gardens, vegetable gardens in general, again, we're looking at probably 6.0 to 6.8, okay. somewhere around that area, where you want to really make sure you have... Um, more extremely acidic soils will be for crops like blueberries. Yes. Yeah. So yes. there you'd be looking at like 4.8 to 5.2. Yes. Man, low. Yeah. Okay. So if you test an area and you're not sure what you want to do with that piece of your property and it comes back low okay. in that range, maybe you would want to plant blueberries there because then you don't have to fight with amending that pH um, because pH doesn't stay changed. You know, right. you have to stay on top of it and That's continue right. um, to amend it if you want to move the natural point. level of that, that pH of that soil. Okay. Well, since you're there, let's quickly talk about how do you adjust the soil pH then? Oh, okay, yeah. definitely. So um, we can really only know amounts if we get our soil sample, like how okay. much we need to add. So that's another reason why it's so important. If we're wanting to raise pHs okay. nearer to 7, you've gotten acidic soil and you need to raise it nearer to 7, you're going to add lime. Okay. Um, right. For homeowners, uh, pelleted lime is going to be the product of choice. Sure. It's easy to apply, um, but then again, you know, it takes time to do its thing. Okay. We, I would not put more than 50 pounds per thousand square feet out at a time. Interesting. Okay. Because there, there again, you may be getting a lot of waste mm. if you over apply. Okay. If you put 200 pounds out, it's not all going to be able to do its thing. Right, gotcha, So gotcha. sometimes if we have a drastic adjustment, you may have to split up that application into two or three applications throughout the year. Okay. So apply the, the first one now, 
wait two or three months, apply it again, wait two or three months, apply it again, and then retest okay. um, to see where you've gotten yourself to and how much more you need you need to go from there. If you have, um, if you're trying to go the opposite way and lower your pH, mm-hmm. <laughs> say that you have a spot that tests like 6.8, but you really want to grow blueberries there, or you really want to grow some acidic shrubbery there, uh, plants that prefer acid soils like azaleas, rhododendrons, mm-hmm. hollies, right. um, things like that. Adding sulfur right. can get you uh, down to that lower pH area where okay. you want to be. And that's an that elemental Elemental sulfur, elemental sulfur mm-hmm. uh, can do the job. I, I probably wouldn't want to use that um, every single time. Okay, okay. Aluminum sulfate right. will do it as well. Um, so, you know, either product. And it just depends. There again, you need to have results from your soil sample to know how much you need to move. But as a rule of thumb, I think it's like 0.2 pounds per 100 wow. square feet <laughs> to move it a tenth of wow, a... Okay of a pH point. So it's, you know, gonna take some calculations and some time, but we need to know what we're starting with before we start adding. Well, garden math. I know, garden math. How about that? I'm always bringing math to the scene. You're always bringing math. We're gonna have to have the you, garden so you So you can do the math, right? <laughs> All right, Celeste, so we appreciate it. That was good information, so thank you much. Thanks, All thanks right. for having me. Right. Mm-hmm. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Miss Debbie. Hi. Always good to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. So hummingbirds, right? Oh, it's fun time of the year. <laughs> Everybody is so excited about hummingbird time. And I can tell you're excited as well. I right? am. <laughs> I am. So you're going to hang a hummingbird feeder for us today, right? I am. Okay. And hopefully somewhere out there a hummingbird's going to zoom right in. Oh, we definitely hope so. <laughs> All right. right. So where do you want to start? Sure. I've brought some samples of hummingbird feeders and two options of hanging them. Okay. Let's start first with the pole. This is a freestanding pole. Okay. And you just push it into the ground as deep as you can. Can you get it? Oh, maybe I need a little more. A little help. Sorry, Grant. Okay. All right. This pole, yes, it'll hold four pounds. Okay. So that is going to take care of any good hummingbird feeder. Okay. And then the other option we've brought is a Uh suction cup window hanger. This will also hold four pounds. And you just push those suction cups to the window till they make that little burp sound. And you know it's on there good and tight. Okay. So now we have two options ready to go. Now we're ready to hang up our feeders. Okay. They're both nectar feeders, mm-hmm. of course. Uh, hummingbirds prefer nectar, which is four parts of water okay. to one part of white table sugar. And hmm. please don't use anything except white table sugar. Okay. Honey is bad. You don't want to use that. You don't want to use sugar substitutes. Huh. And you don't want to use anything with a red dye to it. Okay. Just clear is fine. As you can see, the feeders already have enough coloring okay. on them to attract the birds in. This one also has enough coloring. So the color alone will bring the hummingbirds for mm-hmm. the most part. Oh. It certainly will. Hummingbirds have very good eyesight. They can <laughs> see from a long distance the flowers. They'll go into the flowers for the nectar okay. and the soft-shelled insects. Okay. So what you'll do with this is fill up your reservoir with your sugar water, put your bottom on it, Take it outside and turn it over. And this bottom reservoir will fill up with water and the hummingbirds will go into these little ports to drink. Now, just as if you were at a picnic, (laughs) who likes to come but the ants? That's right. (laughs) That's right. And the ants will come to your hummingbird feeder, get in the nectar, and the hummingbirds won't want anything to do with it because the ants' bodies will break down in that sugar Uh, water. Okay, okay. So you can add a water reservoir above it called an ant trap up above your feeder and then your feeder beneath. Hmm. So you've got 
plain water here. I brought some plain water with, and you just fill that fill up. Fill it up, okay. Only with plain water, because you'll have other little birds that come and sit up here and drink. Okay, okay. You don't want to put any oils or anything like that. We've seen lots of little downy woodpeckers and house finch and that just sitting up here thinking it's their own little watering <laughs> hole. And let's pretend we filled up that hummingbird feeder with the nectar. Okay. The other hummingbird feeder is flat, which is nice because you don't have to worry about dripping. Huh. And to fill that, you're going to pop oh. it open by putting your thumbs on the center and pulling up. So you put your sugar water here, and this one has a built ant, built in ant trap. Huh. So you put your water, water here okay. and your sugar water here. So we'll go ahead and do oh, that God. today so that I brought sugar water, okay. four parts of water. <laughs> One part of sugar, we'll fill that up. And that way, if a hummingbird comes by, he won't be disappointed with an empty feeder. <laughs> and we've got our plain Just water plain here. Water. Okay. And then, oops, would you help me hang that up that. there, please? There we go. Okay. Huh, nice. Perfect. Let's now, now that you've got your food up, you need to maintain your feeders. Okay. Because hummingbirds, just like us, like to eat out of something clean. Sure. That's right. <laughs> sure. And if you don't maintain your feeders, they will get a mold bacteria, which can be harmful to the birds. Plus, if they come into a feeder that's contaminated with that, they're not going to come back to the, that okay. site. Okay. So, since we have this one as an empty display right now, to clean it, you would just unscrew it, put it in hot, soapy water. Mm -hmm. We like Dawn dishwashing liquid because of the breaking up of any oils sure. that might get in there from okay. nature. This one comes Those apart, comes apart. Right. for easy cleaning. Some folks have feeders that's hard to get inside of the bottles, so you can use a brush. Mm -hmm. And in that water, you might want to put a little bit of vinegar Okay. Or maybe just a little bit of bleach to kill any of the mold or bacteria. Nine parts of water to one part of bleach. And use a little port <laughs> brush to clean these areas yeah. here. If you maintain your feeder, every time you're changing your nectar, you should not have any trouble with the mold and bacteria. Now, how often would you change the nectar, though? You need to change it every three to five days, mm -hmm. whether the yeah. birds drink it or not. Wow, okay. And dispose of that which they haven't consumed, just pour it into the ground. Okay. Um, as the heat sets in, then you want to really maintain it every three days or even more frequently. If it okay. gets really cloudy, it's time to change it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The birds have to double their body weight. These little birds don't even weigh as much of, as a penny. Wow. It's and nothing. They, right. Okay. And they have to double that body weight in order to fly for their migration. Don't take your feeder down though. Just when fall starts trickling into September, late September, early October, please leave it up because okay. you never know there might be a straggler mm -hmm. for whatever mm -hmm. reason didn't take the journey. Okay. And they have to fly 600 miles across the Gulf uh, yeah, Coast. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, you know, how far is that flight? 600 it's, miles? It's 600 miles across the Gulf Coast. But, for instance, the hummingbirds you see on here during migration during the fall, mm -hmm. which is usually early September, late August, might not be the ones you see tomorrow. Okay. They migrate at night. Okay. By themselves, about 200 to 250 miles a night. Wow. So maybe it'll be in Jackson tomorrow. Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> wow, how about the hummingbirds? Isn't that, that is, pretty cool? It's pretty neat. It's pretty yeah. neat. I like that. All right, Ms. David, we appreciate that uh, demonstration. You're welcome. You know, with your hummingbirds feeders, and hopefully the folks will go out and get some feeders and feed those hummingbirds for their and long flight, right? That's right. All right, thank you much. Thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. We planted this seasonal bed in April, and it is now September. And the salvia that we planted have never been happy in this bed, so we won't be planting them again. This is not an area that they like. Uh, we did plant the petunias. They did well at first. 
they look all right, but they look like they could use some fertilizer and plus there's irrigation on the bed and they have not enjoyed the irrigation, so they're not as happy here either. But the Vinca absolutely love it here and have taken over and don't they look nice? All right, so let's do our Q&A session. You ready? I'm ready. All right, we have some good questions here. Good. Here's our first viewer email. I found these spots on my okra. I thought they were aphids. I sprayed with an insecticidal soap and baking soda mix. Now the leaves turned black. Was this fungal? And this is from William in Germantown. So he sprayed what he thought. Mm-hmm. Insecticidal soap for aphids. Right. Right. And if it was well, aphids, insecticidal soap should have taken care of it. Should have taken care of the aphids. But there's an insecticidal soap, baking soda mix. Mix. Not sure why you would mix the two because mm -hmm. baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Sodium mm -hmm. will burn foliage. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why he ended up with the black, crispy leaves. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. That's why you had the black leaves. Right. Especially if you sprayed that during the heat of the summer. Oh, good point. So some phytotoxicity, phytotoxicity. action going mm -hmm. on there. I would, I would say that I would have to agree. Just mm -hmm. looking at the picture, you know, I wasn't quite sure. But right. it did look like there was some kind of bugs on those buds, you know, initially. But if, if that were the case and it was aphids, just the insecticidal soap on its own would have been enough. Would have been good enough. Yeah. And I'm sure it's probably, were, it, it, they're probably aphids because I've seen aphids on okra, mm -hmm. you know, oh, all yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I think there's an aphid for every plant maybe in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems like it is, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah every plant has its own, its own kind of aphid. <laughs> yeah, they are everywhere. So there you have it, Mr. William. Uh, the insecticide soap does the trick by itself. No need to mix, you know, baking soda with it, but I think that's what burned the leaves. All right, so here's our next question. All right. Why would a blackberry plant that at one time produced sweet berries now produce only sour ones. Will lime improve sweetness? And this is Miss Jean in Brighton. So what do you think about that? At one time, the blackberries produced sweet berries. Mm -hmm. Now they're sour. My mm. first go-to thought is sun. So okay. what, what, what makes fruit sweet is the production of sugars sure. in the fruit, the formation of those sugars. And if you have a plant that once was in full sun, and was making, producing sweet berries, you know, over a period of years, maybe had a shade tree or a, something that you didn't realize was gonna get quite so tall and, and it happens a lot of times without you even noticing it. And before you know it, those plants are getting shaded. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then maybe they're not having adequate, you know, sugar production. That would be my first guess. And no, I don't think that the addition of lime would <laughs> yeah, make them any, yeah, even any though, sweeter. yeah, even though sometimes we refer to sweetness or sourness of the soil, that doesn't convert to actual, you know, plant okay. fruit sweetness. Good deal. Uh, I actually thought it could have been inadequate watering during fruit development. Water. Because anytime I hear about bitter tasting mm -hmm. fruit or vegetables, the first thing I think about is inadequate watering. Okay. You know, I know it seems like we've had, you know, a lot of water here recently, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of moisture, but yeah, it could be due to that at the time that Def the plant was producing, was producing that right. fruit. Mm -hmm, when right. the crop was coming that's in. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because that's, you know, midsummer, and we mm -hmm. were, we had a, weren't technically in a drought, but we had yeah. several weeks of some sure super, super dry weather, sure probably did. about the time that they would have been coming in, so. Right. All right, so that's what we think, Miss Jean. I hope that helps you out there. All right, here's our next viewer email. These caterpillars are eating leaves on my oak tree. What are they? And this is from Peter. So what do we think those are? They have the black heads, of course, and look at the yellow stripes. Right. What, what kind of tipped me off when I saw this picture first, if you saw the caterpillar that was on the very front, it had an obvious kind of thick yellow striped mm -hmm. band right behind that black head. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've, I'm pretty sure it's a yellow neck caterpillar. Yellow neck caterpillar. Right. They feed in groups, you know, they can do some defoliation, um, but it's so late in the season that the plant, especially if it's a mature tree, you know, has already gathered the energy and stored it in its root system that it's going to need to bud out and, and leaf out next spring. I wouldn't really, would you worry with control? I wouldn't worry about it at all. And you're exactly right. Yellow neck caterpillar wouldn't worry about it this time of the year. 
You know, we're approaching fall. Mm -hmm. The tree has already done its thing. The leaves have already done their job as well. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry about it, you know. But for those who are worried about it, I yeah. mean, there are some pro BT, uh, which you can use for that. Mm -hmm. um, there are some parasitic wasps that could possibly help you out with that as well. True. That are beneficial. True. Um, but yeah, I, I just won't worry too much about it. Mm -mm. You know? And I actually learned this from uh, from Mr. D. You know, he always talks about the yellow necked, you know, caterpillars. When a predator tries to attack them, they raise their heads and posterior really? in attack mode to kind of ward off. Oh, yeah. I've and they all move at one time. Before. Yes, yeah. all yeah. together, all like together. group effort. Right. <laughs> it's like yeah, something's coming to get us. So yeah. Oh, cool. That's they all neat. move at one time. So he likes to mention that a lot. So I didn't know that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So there you have it, Peter. Yellow neck caterpillar. All right, Celeste. We out of time. It was fun. Oh man, we're out yeah. of time. <laughs> we're out of time. Oh, yeah, I had a good time. Thanks right. for asking me to come. And no problem. Good. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. We've posted more information about testing and adjusting pH and hummingbirds on familyplotgarden.com. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.